Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Teacher Strategies for Distance Learning webinar. Kabe is proud to present a series of special speakers who will be sharing effective practices to support English learners throughout California. I am Dr. Carmen Beck, and I'm an adjunct professor at Cal State San Bernardino. So I hope you're in a safe space managing the current circumstances and ready to join together with our Kabe Familia. As we get ready, for today's exciting session, I have a few housekeeping matters to share. As this is a webinar, the speaker's microphones will be active and the participants will be all on mute. There will be interactive times in today's presentation and we will use the chat box for you to enter your comments. If you would like to post a question during the presentation, please also use the chat icon on the Zoom control menu at the bottom of your screen and the chat window will pop up where you will be able to type in your questions or comments. For better focus, we will not be using the Q&A icon or window for today. After the webinar, we will be posting the recorded version so you can re-listen and share it with others. So sit back, back, relax, and get ready for 30 minutes of powerful engagement and learning. Today's webinar is being presented by a CAVIS board member and a longtime friend, my friend Marissa Lasso Neko. And her webinar is Partnering with Families to Survive Summer During COVID 19. So now please join me in welcoming Marissa Lasso Neko. Hi, thank you, Dr. Beck, for having me over. Thank you to the Cave family and the team for inviting me to join this amazing series. So I think um, we are just going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone who's joining. I see we have some participants in the house, and I'm excited. We know how, how important this work is, and we know you're busy. So um, we also know how many webinars and Zoom meetings we have. So thank you for joining us in this series. Um, and making family and community engagement a priority in the work that we do because it really is essential. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. And somebody said, hola, Marisa. So hola, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go into full screen version here. So bear with me with technology. And I think I am not projecting. I want to say hola to everyone in the house. Saludos to everyone in the house. Um, a little bit about me because obviously we are familia. Cava is truly a familia, a family, um, but we always have new family members. So a little bit about me, um, uh, Marisa Lazoneco is my name. Uh, you can call me Marisa. And I am uh, a family community engagement content manager with the San Bernardino um, County Superintendent of Schools. And I'm also very proud to serve in the Cava board as uh, board of directors for parent, um, I work with parent relations and currently for paraprofessional um, affairs. So I'm really excited that uh, we have been in strong partnership with the county and CAVE so we can continue to provide the support of around family and community engagement. Um, I want to say I'm thankful that I'm, I'm here on behalf of CAVE board and also on behalf of San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. And so I do want to send a shout out to my colleagues and my boss in San Bernardino County, Dr. Robin McAver Brown, who is such an inspirational leader, and she allows me to do all the work that we need to do in the community. Also, Superintendent Alejandra, who's strong um, partner and strong supporter of the work that CABE does, and who's also an inspirational leader uh, that supports um, strongly the work of family and community engagement. Uh, and my colleagues, Marcelino Marcerna and Alma Hernandez, who are partners in this work. And I do want to bring that to attention because as we're going to talk about family and community engagement, we are strong believers that we cannot do this work alone. We need a team. And so I'm so very proud to be part of a team who believes in this work. Um, and I want to say this because these are very interesting times and we are learning a lot from the work that we're doing. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm bringing um, the lens of uh, our journey um, as CABE, uh, our journey as San Bernardino County, and also the journey that we have learned um, the, during the uh, last year uh, through the Community Engagement Initiative, which is a statewide initiative, which CABE 
um, is part of CCEE, is part of uh, families in schools and San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. We are strong partners who are uh, leading in this initiative for systems of support. Um, so we have a, a, a very broad lens of family and community engagement. And as teachers, um, as district leaders, you have a very front view and very front need. So we know that uh, some of the times that our role is to support the work because we have the privilege to really develop and learn from each other and create systems to support districts. We know that the closer you are to the school, to the classroom, the least time you have for planning and the more needs you see on a day-to-day -day basis. So really, I can't thank you enough for this time. So I'm bringing support um, to you today that may be at times from a county perspective, at times how to support um, districts. And some of the ideas will be how do districts um, support site and also how can teachers at the site level uh, work with the family and community engagement staff to reach out to families. So I hope the different lenses help today with this conversation because it really does take a team. Um, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, I think that uh, these times are very interesting. None of us here in this um, webinar or anyone, I think most of the people that we know uh, can say that they've lived through a pandemic like this where worldwide we are impacted. So we knew what family and community engagement looked like before March 13th or before we shut down. But after uh, in California, after March 13th, we have really had to reconsider what that looks like and pivot a lot of our services. So I want to start with this graph here. Um, CAVE um, and our community engagement initiative um, is a strong belief on conocimiento, learning from the community. And CAVE, uh, through Project to Inspire Parent Leadership Series, um, has really promoted conocimiento opening activities. So we learn from the community that we're serving. And so I would like to start by um, prompting this question. And um, it's really based on this graphic that when first, when we first heard schools are going to close for three weeks and we started learning that it could go more, uh, we started learning about COVID-19 quite fast. And this zones kind of um, were part of our life on a daily basis. So how do we respond to life, to education, to our families, to our own uh, professional life or personal life in that time. Um, some of us on March 13th or March 14th, around that time, um, started with the fear zone. Just there's no food, there's no resources at the stores, um, there's a lot of lack of um, technology, uh, there's no access to technology in some homes. So that fear zone that really took um, over a lot of us. Some of us probably moved to the learning zone or some of us maybe start at the learning zone. Um, just, you know, what is it that is under my control and what is not under my control? Um, how do I make myself aware of things that are useful and, and resourceful and how do I not um, acknowledge that everybody's doing their best? So we're not perfect, but we're trying our best. And so on during time, or maybe a lot of us never really went to that first tier, second tier, but we started with that growth zone, um, using skills to service um, somebody else's need. Uh, think of how to help others, uh, finding that purpose in that time um, and leaving the present, staying the present. So um, some of us might have experienced all three tiers and some of us might have just, you know, experienced two or three. So as a conocimiento in our chat box, if you can type, um, which ones have you experienced up to now? Uh, you can put one, two, and three, if you have experienced all three, or you can put one and two, or two and three, or just three. And I don't see the chat box right now, but I will try to find it. Um, so if you can actually start just sharing in the chat box. We'll read them to you, Marissa, no worries. Thank you, Dr. Beck. So I see two and three, two and three, myself, two and three, all three, all three, two, three. And people have experienced all of them and then changed between one and another. So most of the people have experienced all three. 
a couple people two and three, and then um, Latanya said one and two. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing those. So as we can see, um, just in our, in our conversation here today, most of us are experienced from one to three, um, two to three, uh, one and two, and um, I myself have experienced one, two, and three. And um, so thank you so much for joining in the conocimiento. It was a brief conocimiento. If we were face-to-face, -face, we'll probably enjoy in the, in the conversation and, and talk more about how that looked like and how that felt. Um, but due to the, to the technology um, arena we're under today, we're gonna uh, just continue uh, with the conversation, taking your wisdom and your own experience into this conversation. So as staff, um, as community partners, we have experience level one, two, and three of this um, zone, right? As we experience a pandemic that we have never experienced before. And so thinking of um, how we are in education and the, the way that we can navigate um, education, uh, a lot of us in education, we um, make a lot of connections with other uh, others not in education, but like, for example, in Cabe, we meet people who have connections or resources in other arenas and so we learn how to network with one another and even with those um, access we experience a, a um, an anxiety if we are in the fear zone we experience uh, uncertainty if we are in that learning zone how do we how do we move forward and how do I feel better to my normal and this new normal so as I found myself um, going through this zones um i stopped at one point and i thought i can't imagine how families who are not at all connected in education who don't have the access that i do i have a laptop i have a technology setting our work was able to provide us what we needed so we can work from home um my kids they you know they use my ipad they use my cell phone i was i knew how to navigate um this platform I knew how to navigate um, Google Classroom, I knew Zoom, and I was learning WebEx, but I knew how to navigate most of it. Um, I have, I'm an English learner myself, but I understand now enough English to, to read through stuff and, and, and learn about it. And I still experience all three tiers of this, um, this reaction, right? This, um, this natural human reaction through the fear, learning, and growth zone. And, as I was feeling stressed myself as a mom, or, you know, having to do the homeschooling and work, I stopped and I thought, what about the families that don't have all of that? What about the families that do not have the access, do not have the language? How are they finding themselves here? And so um, through that lens, uh, we started working as a county staff with our new reality. Um, it wasn't just me, but really our team started thinking about you know, here's the new reality, right? The new normal and never changing normal because things were changing so fast and they continue to change. We are now, we're in a new different phase, opening up more things and we still don't know what it's gonna look like. So um, what came to us after March 13th is all schools adopted an online platform. We moved, now we're, uh, we're ready, getting ready to close one school year, going to summer and prepare for the next school year. Um, and we needed to know how to be able to support our children through that. And um, again, keeping in mind, we have access, we have the language, and we have the network to be able to support each other. How can we support those who don't? And so in this um, next few minutes, I wanna invite you to, um, to, with your own conocimiento, with your own experiences, uh, work with me and walk with me through this presentation, thinking of those that are most vulnerable right now because they don't have the access, they don't have the language. Um, and we're going now into summer, uh, we are in summer break, and um, we know that we still don't know what it's gonna look like in the fall, but how can we best prepare to support our, our students that will come back? Um, so in our county, when we thought this is our new reality, uh, we start to think about this, what, it, what was exposed, right? So through this pandemic, um, it kind of exposed how vulnerable we are in the broadband, broadband access. Um, it showed also the access gap with our African-American and English language learners' families. Um, it also showed that districts were offering 
a lot of resources, pickups and packet deliveries to students. Um, but we must ask ourselves, are all of our families um, tapping into these resources? Are they all raising their hand and saying, my student needs? And I have a personal um, just testimony with, within my own sphere, my, my kids' school. I know um, a few of the parents who they work so much and they, they you know, they share um, family, um, they, they co-parent, uh, right? So they, their kids stay one week with one parent and another, another week with another parent. Uh, because of work, they also have to go to grandparents' house and they have to now stay with mom one week and then grandparents' house because of the parents' work schedules. Um, and so some of these families were not able to even pick up some of the technology was, that was being distributed or did not have time to go pick up resources during the daytime because of their own work schedules. And so we must continue to ask ourselves, are families tapping into the resources that we are providing? And if not, is it because they don't need it or is it because the, there's lack of information? Um, another thing that was raised was districts are offering hotspots and again in connectivity uh, because of the issues that um, were uh, surfacing, uh, but some families may not be um, raising their hand and saying, I need one because of different things or cultural diversities. Um, I know in my family, we are, um, I'm an English learner. We came to this country when I was 11 years old. And I know my dad is one of those Latinos that, you know, they're like, we don't need to ask for anything that we don't need more of. And so sometimes there's a little bit of shaming asking in our, you know, cultural diversity families. Um, and I say that to say that uh, we have to be aware of that. And it's really hard for families to come up and say, you know, I need this. And so um, all of this kind of surfaced as we were experiencing COVID-19. Uh, some children were attending classes and some were not. And so the question had to continue, where are these children? How are these families? How can we, con how can we um, reach out to our families to make sure our children are needing, are receiving what they need? and they're getting the resources and the supports that they need. Uh, so some of the um, strategies, and I wanna um, throw a little shout out to my colleague, Marcena, who came up with this um, slide uh, in one of our presentations. Um, we thought, you know, one of the um, strong uh, suggestions that our team came up with was, these are four important areas that we need to continue to build on or we need to enhance. So the first thing is communicating with families. Um, we need to make sure that we have strategies to check in with families, um, especially families of English language learners. Um, all families need to be reached out to, but we know that there's a, a language barrier uh, with some of our families. So how can we uh, brainstorm outside of the box to work with staff? Um, some schools have FACE um, staff, and FACE stands for Family and Community Engagement Staff. Um, so how can we tap with tap into that resource to um, make personal phone calls with families to identify potential needs and, and be able to um, break through those barriers, right? And I think this part right here, it boils down to relationship. It's beyond that phone call home. Um, I know that we get that phone call from the office staff. Hi, this is, you know, such and such from um, your elementary school and we're just calling to let you know. And that is a phone call that, um, it, it doesn't really require much uh, relationship building. And so when I say communication with family, I, um, I think what we're, what we're saying is that personal call where um, there will be a person um, on the other hand, uh, inside the school, well, representing the school building and, and reaching out to families and introducing themselves and saying, I'm just reaching out to make sure that everything is okay with Eliana. Um, does she have what she need? Um, we noticed that you know some of her um, some of the days she was not able to join the class. We want to make sure that everything's okay, and so that communication, the the relationship building, it really requires time and trust. Um, the next thing um, it's to have the parent the belief that we need to build on our parents. That continuous belief. We believe that before uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, and now more than ever parents are our partners. They're, we believe that parents are essential partners and the number one teacher before COVID-19. Now we have seen how it really um, shifted to a, a focus of the learning happening at home. And so now more than ever, we need to work with families to 
have um, that home-like school and the school-like home environment, where at school, kids will receive the love and the caring that they need, and at home, they'll receive all the, the academic support. And again, going back to that first point, if, it's, if the relationship is not there, if the trust is not there, it's really hard to move um, the information and the resources to the home because we don't know what what is in existence and what there is lack of. Um, so building the capacity for parents, it really means what we mean is continue to build their leadership so they can navigate uh, policies, they can navigate um, distance learning, they can tap into resources. And I'm gonna throw a shout out to Project to Inspire's um, curriculum and that's CABE's Project to Inspire curriculum. Um, we are very lucky that prior to COVID-19, a lot of our uh, districts and sites had already partnered with CABE and brought Project to Inspire at their district level, at their school site level. And so Project to Inspire believes in a three-tier parent leadership approach, where the first one is awareness, the other one is building on that awareness, and that third tier, it's really um, parent um, facilitators, parent leaders, uh, parents coaching other parents. And so uh, that builds that comadre, the compadre network when we, that we know that we need, because if there is a language barrier and districts are disseminating a lot of information, we know that the parents that know how to navigate communication and they know how to um, access their phone, their text messages, then they know how to access the emails that are coming, they're following school sites on Twitter, they know already how to navigate it, but not all parents are there. So when we have those parent leaders that understand how to navigate and they know how to navigate, they know who are the ones, who are their neighbors that don't have that. And so they can share information with one another. And so uh, one example is um, Kabe did watch uh, Facebook watch uh, parties for families. And so if you have parent leaders, they'll be able to share that with other parents through their cell phones, um, uh, tagging them on Facebook, right? We have, um, um, We've had a lot of parent, uh, districts that have their parent, cop, um, their parent, um, either it is their leadership group meetings or coffee with the principal, and they were able to have that and air it through Facebook. Um, that way, par more parents can um, listen to the information. Not all parents know how to navigate Zoom, so um, if the meeting is happening through Zoom. Um, those parents that know how to access, they have the information, they know how to navigate technology, they, they will be able to join. Um, but what I mean by uh, need working with parents um, to disseminate information to other parents is how can we work beyond the, um, the systems, the technology systems that we have in place to where more families that don't have that can access information. And so um, hats off to Kabe really for their uh, watch book the Facebook watch parties, because I know that a lot of the families that were not receiving information, they were thankful that uh, they got an invitation. And a lot of the families nowadays have Facebook. They may not have Zoom, they may not know how to navigate Zoom, but they do have Facebook, they have um, WhatsApp. And so tapping into those um, apps and platforms that most families have, it's important at this time. Uh, the enrollment protocol is, um, we know that we're in summer, but we're trying to organize ourselves for the fall. So how are we working with our families right now to make sure that they know uh, what's needed, the, doc the documentation that is needed. If they are moving, what do they need to do? All these processes and protocols that are in place, how do we work um, through our platforms to disseminate the information? But then again, tapping into that parent leadership component, how do we work with other parents to help us disseminate the information? And, and get to more families than we can. And of course, um, that's such an important piece right now, engaging external partners, so working with our community partners to identify the needs in the community and also bring the resources that are needed to fill that gap in that need. Um, so um, just I'm gonna just share a few examples of um, what we did in San Bernardino County. Um, when March 13th happened, we thought, you know, we need to quickly build a page to help uh, fill with resources for families through, during this time. And so as you can see right here, we said the resources below are free. Uh, do take a moment to scroll down to the resources for English learners section. So we had a, a section just for English learners. We had a section for all students. Um, so here are some examples of what we, we uh, some links that we provided. 
here's our distance learning resource hub. So we um, also partnered with KVCR to develop some lessons and the lessons were also translated into Spanish. And this is a strong partnership between Riverside County Office of Ed and San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. Um, and we did that thinking of um, parents need to have more resources and understand how to navigate this process right now. So really the intent is not, um, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the intent was not to stress parents more um, because we know that they're doing our, their best. Uh, hats off to all parents, all family members uh, for their, their efforts um, during the last few months of school. Um, we know it's already stressful enough with homework time and overnight parents became homeschoolers. And so we know that that's such an important piece. Um, so we do have, um, we, in, in our county, we thought, how can we make sure that we work um, with our partners in the community to disseminate information to families? And of course, um, KVCR is a strong partner here for Riverside and San Bernardino. And so we developed those lessons in partnership with Riverside, uh, in, translated them into Spanish. And they are there. Um, uh, if you go to this link, and we also have a resource um, um, handout that Kavi will provide to you. Uh, this page is listed and all the resources that I'll share are listed in that resource page. Um, you can go through it and you can see the different lessons that are being provided. And of course, they're being aired on TV. Um, another example of what we did is um, we decided to organize all of these resources were so much and overwhelming. And as a parent, uh, both my colleague Mars and I we were thinking, you know, as parents, it's a lot. We're getting a lot of information sent from um, our schools, our districts, the media. So how do we organize this a little bit so families don't feel so overwhelmed? And so as we had conversations with our districts, uh, with our school sites, uh, some of the things they share were the same thing. We have a lot of information in our websites. We just don't know if families are being able to tap into them. And so an idea that came out of uh, natural um, networking conversations with our districts was, can we sort of sort out this uh, resources? And can we also do some kind of series where families can get this information without having to navigate through many pages? Uh, because as parents, we know our time is very busy. And so some of us are working from home and doing stuff from home, but, um, and then during the summer, some, some of us are able to go back to our offices and work from our offices and come back home. Some of us are not so, but still, how can we make it easier to navigate without adding too much stress. And so we sorted this um, information into these three, three categories, uh, the technology access, the social, emotional, and behavioral health, and the basic needs and community resources. So I'm gonna just take a few minutes to walk you through them and give you examples of what we did um, and how do we build capacity for our districts to do the same. So the first thing that we did was uh, we thought uh, of having districts um, Facebook watch parties um, so we interviewed districts and um, the, the purpose of these interviews was to help them lift the resources that they were providing to, to uh, the families um, in those three categories, technology, social, emotional, behavioral support, and resources in the community. So here are some examples of what that looked like. Um, one of our districts shared um, all those three categories and I'm just highlighting one of them. Uh, like the grab and go meal program that they have and how they're going to do that during um, those months that we were ending school year. And also what does that look like? What's the schedule during the summer? Same thing here, um, mental health support. Um, if your student was receiving some support um, prior to COVID-19, they still need the support and now more than ever. So how can they now tap into this um, telehealth session? in uh, phone call sessions that they can still receive the services. Uh, we talked about if you have technology or not have technology, how can your children do distance learning? And uh, what are the processes that they had to go through? So that's kind of uh, what we did as a county, knowing and understanding that we had that privilege to, to have time to plan. We know that when you're at the site level, um, you're almost, you're frontline. So you know you have to react and the need is every day. And so um, we wanted to support districts um, by helping them lift those informations and sharing them through Facebook, watch parties, sharing them through um, YouTube. Uh, that way more and more families that are not used to navigating uh, websites can get it. Um, again, that Comadre Network, Compadre Network. 
your friends can always tag you in a, in a Facebook post. They can always tag you in a YouTube post. They can send you a link in the cell phone. So it's more accessible. It's not in a website. Um, and here are some other um, ideas and strategies that we know uh, work and um, have been utilized with districts, not only in our county, but also districts um, from across the state. So FACE staff, again, family and community engagement staff may um, have made initial personal contacts to all families to identify um, first to just to let them know they're there, build those strong relationships and identify those needs that um, may not be expressed so easily. Um, again, shifting in mindset around technology usage, um, instructional day and academic focus. Some of our families have never had technology in their home and now all of a sudden technology is there. So how do we help them learn to access it, uh, navigate it, and, um, and support them in this process? Especially because we know uh, through COVID-19, it's not really going away today and, or tomorrow. Uh, we still don't know what the fall is gonna look like. And as we go to summertime, um, sharing with families that you know, we need to prepare, we need to continue to prepare uh, for the fall. Um, creating district level distance learning content for families in multiple language. Again, um, the data showed that 24% of non-English speakers, um, they did not receive information in their own languages. And four out of five Latinos or African-American families expressed concern that they didn't have the resources their child need, uh, needed to be able to stay focused and on track. And so knowing that data that surfaced real quickly, and uh, I, I wanna throw a little shout out to um, Ed Trust West for sharing their data during the last CASA webinar. And I know other uh, people have had some surveys that um, highlighted data around that gap. Um, knowing what has surfaced, we need to be intentional about how do we make distance learning accessible for all families um, and prepare for what's to come in the fall. Um, holding virtual family trainings through webinars. So your parent leader meetings, um, your cafecitos with the principal, um, showing families um, how to navigate that, not assuming that they will just get the handout and be able to log into Zoom. So again, going back to that first point, uh, reaching out to families that we may think they don't have the access. Do they know how to access Zoom? Can we send them links on how to access um, the platforms that we're using, Google Classroom, um, any of the language that they need? Um, holding virtual decision-making and commi commitment meetings. Um, and developing a committing, uh, um, developing and committing to a clear communication plan, including increased social media presence, uh, regular updates. So knowing that our families, um, especially the, our families that are vulnerable and they don't have the access or the language, how do we make sure that we are communicating with them? Um, going back to that uh, three-tier sphere, all of us have experienced it. And we'll continue to experience it as things change. Um, but families that don't have the access or the language, they will experience it more and they will stay more in that first tier because of the language, because of the access, because of the resources and the communication, the lack of communication that they're receiving. So how can we increase that with our families that are not, um, that we're not hearing from? And we don't know if it's because of lack of access or language. Um, so as we go, as we know all of this happened as we ended the school year, we know we're still preparing for some of that to happen as we start the fall. Um, we know we introduced a lot of platforms for families. We introduced a lot of technology um, apps that the, their kids were now using um, to tap into content, to tap into resources and supports. Um, but the way I see it is we all of a sudden built a pool in the back yard of our families' homes. So some of our families never had technology access or they were not supporting technology. They were not um, having their kids tap into that much technology at home um, or at least not for educational purpose, purposes. And now all of a sudden they had to because that's what it was required. And so we introduced the pool, a new way of living uh, right in their backyard. And so we need to think of how do we introduce a new way of living uh, with introductions of uh, supports around that. So what are the parameters? What is safety and what, is, what does that look like and what is not safe? So we have um, here, I'm, I'm, I put some examples of some apps that kids are now using because 
whether it is um, teacher is um, sharing information, they're meeting it, it through that platform, they're getting some support, they're getting some little mid tips. Um, these are now new um, technologies that we need to um, have parents understand also the risks um, that they bring. So like TikTok, some teachers opened up their own TikToks to put some uh, content and material for kids because we know that a lot of the young kids are in that uh, platform. Instagram, um, more kids are utilizing it. Snapchat, um, uh, that has been there and there's a lot of risk because things are posted and they're removed immediately. Um, and so kids feel safe to send information and receive information through there. Um, house party, it's a video chat. A lot of people started use, utilizing house party because it's kind of like a Zoom um, a platform and you can share a screen. It's just, you cannot share uh, you know, a PowerPoint as far as I know. Um, there's other chatting places that kids are meeting through. And so things to consider is, as we introduce these platforms to our families, are we sending information from the school saying, here are some flat platforms your kids may be utilizing for technology purposes. Here are some platforms that they're not utilizing or they don't need to use. Um, because if kids have the information but parents don't, then there is a lack of communication with our crucial partners. So our families need to know which platforms are we utilizing and how we're utilizing them and which platforms they don't their kids don't need to access because of the risk and so um we need to share with our families what is um what are those risks the inappropriate content uh public default settings location tracking and sharing real-time video streaming um temporary pics and videos being posted cyber bullying especially as we go into summer um we introduce a lot of technology and now we without the time to provide that professional development. And we will come back in the fall with also some technological uh, platforms. So how do we support families um, understanding which are those platforms and what to look for, as well as those things that, um, those platforms that their kids don't need to use for educational purposes. So if your child is using this, it's definitely not because we're asking them to. Um, some of our families said, you know, send us a list of that because my kid is saying that she needs squad to be able to meet with her with her friends and i thought oh i think it's google classroom but again you know this is what their kids are saying um and so we need to make sure that that communication goes to the families as well um so i recommend it um to a lot of our districts to share um common sense media because it's, it's in english i put here the spanish version of it um, you know, um, consejos sobre medios y tecnología para tu familia. So how do you do, utilize technology? What are some free resources that kids can get? Um, te uh, technology uh, tips for families. Um, also, it, they also have some um, tips on, on um, content and curriculum. So five um, educational applications that you can use without any internet. Um, again, looking into that access and, and, and families being able to um, access technology support. Um, and then also how to code and, and, and how to program some of these apps. Um, they also have some tips around academic content like um, lectura, matematicas. So they do have some great tips um, on how to um, build on their um, academic content. So they have from art, mathematics, science, um, and it's in Spanish. They do have some great video tips uh, that I recommend to parents. So these are just examples of um, some resources that we share with our family engagement staff so they can share with their parents. Uh, I'm going to briefly go into our social, emotional, behavioral um, health and basic need uh, resources that um, we kind of highlighted for districts and we also um, support the districts as they, as they support their families and their schools with it. So going back to this um, uh, three, uh, three layers of spheres of the fear zone, the learning zone and the growth zone, we know um, when it comes to social, emotional, uh, behavioral health, um, nothing else scares us more um, than we, when we don't have our basic needs met. And so lack of will have us go to that fear zone. And so, um, how can we, as teachers, as family engagement staff, as district staff, how can we um, work with families, reach out with fa to families 
connect with them, build that relationship, that trust, that will allow us to learn the need. Um, so we can provide that support around the emotional uh, need that they have, the behavioral, um, um, I guess the behavioral support that their children need. Um, the stress level that parents are facing right now in these times, um, how can we support them? Um, we're going into summer again, families um, have to work, kids stay home. Um, they're not necessarily going into the classroom now, um, but how do they still continue to support their kids learning? Because this is not gonna be a summer's life. This might be a summer tsunami, knowing that we left in March uh, with what we knew we had and everything from March on. Um, it really, it's really hard to gauge right now until we come back where kids are at. And so how can we support parents with what they do best at home, right? Which is support their kids, love their kids, keep them safe. Um, so do we know the needs? The question goes back to, do we know what resources our families have or they need? Um, and if we don't, how can we reach out to them to know about those needs? Um, and those basic needs are so important. So here are three things that we recommend. So face staff, family engagement, family and community engagement staff and our teachers um, supporting each other um, so they can reach out to families to build that relationship, that trust, to assist with the language barriers. Um, do they have what they need? Um, if they don't have um, academic resources, where can they get them? Um, if they don't know how to access um, or navigate the the technological platforms that their kids are in, how can we support them in that process? They may have the links, but they don't know how to uh, navigate the links. So can we reach out to them and help them um, uh, navigate them? Again, uh, face staff and teachers helping and supporting each other to understand the resources that the schools are providing and maybe families are not tapping into. I know a lot of our districts said um, we have to, uh, clinicians who were supporting students before COVID-19 came to be. And now we have organized ourselves so they can continue to make those phone call appointments and they support our students and maybe even our families because our families are experiencing need and um, there's been an increase in domestic uh, violence. So um, that has a lot to do with the stress that we have been experiencing and our climate, as we can see um, across our state and across our nation, um, has been up and down the last few weeks, right? And it's the level of stress people have experienced. Um, so how can we tap in, how can we um, connect with families, learn about those needs and help them tap into the resources that we are providing at schools? Um, as well as that point three, how can we help them navigate the community resources? Our community partners are coming in and they're offering a lot of support to our families but they may not know about it. So how can we um, connect our families? And it really goes back to that point one. Are we reaching out um, to, uh, to our families in general? And are we reaching out to our families who we know um, may not have the access or the language um, to be able to navigate these resources? So uh, one of the things that we did, um, we did a little seminar, uh, my colleague and myself, um, a few weeks back just saying, hey, we're going into summer. And so here are some things that we need to do um, to survive summer together, because we are gonna be preparing for the fall. Um, and it's been a few weeks that now we are all in the same house. We've been sharing spaces. We are in, on each other's um, space all day long with our kids. And so that mental health is more than ever needed um, because behavior shows up a lot more often, right? And so um, even if during summer you're not at at home with your kids, how can you, um, how can we support you to do what you need to do as a parent, knowing that you have to still navigate the stress of what it's gonna be like in the fall, the stress of um, having your kids at home and there are no, there may not be any childcare for them or summer school programs and what can they do so they're not all the time using an iPad or TV or technology. So the first thing that we know and we tell parents is um, think of behavior as a form of communication. It really is not, it, behavior is not good or bad. It's just behavior. If you cannot um, talk about it, you're going to express it with your behavior. You're going to act it out. So when our kids are acting it out, it really is communicating something. So we say um, helping our parents understand that 
all behavior really is a form of communication. And behavior might be the only way that our kids and our teenagers can express themselves. Um, the question is, what is the, the need? And right now with what we've been experiencing, thinking of our own processing and our own stress, and we're adults and we have that frontal lobe part of the brain that can help us make higher level conclusions, our children may not be there. Um, it does not even start growing until age 13, as we know, right? So some of our kids may not even have that um, beginning process to help them um, make higher level conclusions and process what's going on across um, our state, what's going on in the school, what is it gonna look like for them next school year? Um, so helping them process and their emotions and helping them see what, how could it look like? Um, it's something that we need to do as adults, but it's really hard to take care of someone when we ourselves are not feeling good. So um, I also share with our families that um, just like everything that we said happens for kids, it really also happens for us adults. Behavior is a communication. So if we're feeling frustrated, we are communicating something. There is a need that we have. If we're feeling um, just mad or upset or, you know, um, uh, afraid, there is, a, there is a need and it's com being communicated. So how can I process that, give myself some time to think about how I feel as a parent, process that and be able to separate that first before I go and support my child. So I'm not venting and, and giving my stress or, or, or reacting to my kid's behavior with my own need. Um, so some ways to support is to, you know, ha having our families tap into um, active, uh, proactive ways to um, listen to our kids, to be able to, to support them emotionally. So for example, listen actively to them, um, acknowledge their feelings, um, helping them to speak with I feel statements um, and allowing time to process emotions. And all of this really applies to us adults too. So um, helping our families know that it's okay to share with somebody else how you feel about them, about certain things, about your kids, about your stress. It's okay to, to vent to someone about it, to acknowledge how you feel. It's okay to, to share with your kids how they, their behavior makes you feel. And it's okay to allow time for you to feel better before you come to a, a conversation with them. We know that these techniques, um, um, when we are conscious about them and we're intentional and we bring it constantly to the conversation with our families, our families are most likely to say, you know, there are some things that I, I could do um, differently or maybe I could help my kid differently. Um, and it really is a prevention method to help them de-escalate situations. And knowing that uh, the stress that families are under, that we are under, um, these tips really help um, to set us into, in a better space to have a conversation with our children. Especially because we are now more, more than ever in the same space at the same time. As we open through these different phases, we may be um, having more um, space apart, um, but still we need to help our families with that support um, because we are coming back in the fall and we want kids to code switch back to a school setting. So here are some things that families can do during the summer to um, kind of help them um, put some prevention methods on um, to prevent negative behavior. And also um, this method could also help them transition better back to school in the fall. So uh, we know that these four things are so critical and we, a lot of us as teachers, as educators, we we try to bring this into a school setting, right? How can we make sure that our schools and our classrooms are predictable? Um, meaning uh, we have same regular schedule, we have uh, clear expectations across the school and across uh, the different classrooms, um, that the message is consistent or all of the adults are sharing the same message and reminding kids about those expectations. Um, the message is positive. It's not on a negative note. It's, it's saying what we expect them to do. And we reinforce that with positive feedback, um, paying attention to the, the, the good things that we're seeing, not the bad things that we're seeing. Um, so if a kid is, um, you know, in the classroom, if the kid is um, now walking instead of running, oh, that was nice that you're walking in the hallway. I appreciate that. And then, um, being safe is so important in the school as it is in the home. So these are things that in the school setting we have and parents can easily, as a mom, I can think of how can I can easily apply that in my own home. So have predictable schedule for my kids. 
during summer. If I know we're in summer, um, but how can we have a schedule where you know what you're going to do? That way there's less anxiety on what's expected of you. And that message is consistent. I'm, I'm repeating that expectation as well as my husband, Aldo, is repeating that expectation. It's positive. When the kids are doing what we're asking them to do, we're going to give them some positive feedback. Thank you so much for you know, picking up your toys. I really appreciate how you did exactly what I asked you to do. Or, and they're, they're feeling safe, right? So these are four components that we thought um, families can easily apply and we're not giving them one more thing to do. It's something that they can just um, develop within their household. And um, it could look as easy as, you know, setting a schedule with clear expectations. Um, so as teachers thinking, or, or our district partners, thinking of resources that we can send home in a very easy, with, the, with an easy, accessible um, way. Um, here are some resources um, for you and uh, parents. We thought of sending you a, a sample calendar um, that may look like this, and, and this will help you set up a very um, a regular schedule for your kids that will have a consistent message um, with positive reinforcement of what is expected of them, and, and it will make both your lives and their lives um, a lot less um, conflicting. So we can share this with them. And by helping parents set up a schedule, it really helps the students with the preventative support and methods to reduce their stress. Because as kids, if they don't know what's expected of them every day, and, and, and it really is, you know, we're living it hour by hour, day by day. Um, I don't know what's expected of me in the afternoon. And whether I'm with mom or with dad, it's gonna be different. Um, there is a level of anxiety in that and then not knowing. Uh, but also as parents, we have anxiety because we don't know what is next. Are they doing what we asked them to do? Did they do it yesterday? Are they doing what I asked them to do uh, last night, this morning, or did they do it last night? Um, so having a schedule and having that clear expectation, it really reduces the level of stress and confusion in the home. Um, and supporting to prepare them, um, we're also supporting them to prepare them for the fall. Uh, when we come back into school, there will be some expectations. and let's just think about the time that we've been off school. So since March, kids have been off school, they've had a flexible schedule. Um, we have to introduce a routine before they go back. And so the way I, um, the way that we're sharing with our district partners and our school site uh, partners is helping parents um, set up a schedule that can um, help them prepare their, um, their kids into a routine that will um, translate into what a fall schedule may look like or may not uh, because we know that the path ahead is very unpredictable we don't know what it's gonna look like uh, it may look like um, uh, we have we know we have a plan a B and C a is um, as things as usual as they were uh, coming back in person a B plan which is some kind of hybrid model or a C fully online but we know depending on the district depending on how things change and how things look within the next 14, 15 days, um, it will determine a lot of um, what districts will decide and adopt. And so we don't know what it's gonna look like and that's the reality. And we need to be transparent with our families around that. But what we know is no matter what reality we have, uh, we will have social distancing. We will have uh, possibly staggering student schedules and uh, wearing masks. We may have, we will have increased hand washing opportunities for our kids. Uh, we will probably continue that remote learning, the access and, and helping parents have access to um, technology because that will continue. Uh, we'll continue to have sanitizing classrooms and devices. So knowing what we, we will have in place, how can we help parents um, uh, with setting up some structure that could help kids practice this because eventually we will have our kids back in the classroom in some way, whether it is that A model, B model, or C model, we will have kids coming into our, our, our school settings. Um, and it will be a, a hard to code switch if we don't have that practice time. So um, I hope this last few slides were helpful um, to you um, as far as getting some ideas of, again, how we as a county supported our districts and also um, in turn, how our districts are supporting school sites, teachers, in reaching out and partnering with families. Um, so we can all prepare for a successful uh, 2021 school year 
and also survive summer in these new times. Thank you, Dr. Carmen Beck. I think at this point, I don't know if we have any questions that I can take. Let's see. I think that you have given us a lot of information, Marissa, and your participants are probably thinking of a thousand ideas that they can do to support their parents, which is so important for us. And we don't want any student left out and parents are key to that. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and um, in support of all educators and their families. It has been a powerful addition to our teacher strategies for distance learning webinar series. And I just wanna say thank you and thank you to all of our participants for joining our webinar. And on behalf of the CAVE board, which includes you, Marissa, of directors <laughs> and the full CAVE team, we hope you have found these strategies valuable to your work with students. I'm sure we're gonna call you again because there is a lot for us to do. And I especially love the idea of having some trainings for our parents during the summer so they can be ready for this. And uh, I just want to encourage everyone to check out our CAVE Facebook for more information on upcoming webinars and to visit our CAVE page at www.gocave.org to find the recording of the session and the handouts. Marissa is providing us with handouts too with all the materials that she discussed. So everything will be posted by tomorrow and I just want to say thank you again to all of you, to Marissa and to all the participants. And please stay safe, be well, and know that we're all in this together. We are Cabe Strong. So thank you and hasta la próxima. <laughs>